And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. Yes, yeah. business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at preneurmarketing.com. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of PreneurCast with me, Dom Goucher, and somewhere in a minute, Pete Williams. A little bit of a change up this week, and you may or may not know that Pete regularly gets asked to do live speaking gigs and other kind of interviews, uh, guest blog posts, generating content for other people's training courses, all kinds of stuff. And what we've got for you today is an interview that Pete did a while ago with a chap called Alan Fawcett from the UK. Alan hosts a podcast called the Infinite Pie Podcast, which supports Alan's consulting and coaching business. And we thought that this would be a really good interview for you to hear. First of all, because it gives you a little bit more of an insight into the way that Pete thinks and where Pete came from, where he gets his ideas from, how he got started, all this stuff. Um, but also because Alan asks some kind of different questions, uh, questions that we don't always necessarily cover on our podcast, but that we thought the answers were quite interesting and enlightening. And it gives you also an insight into Alan's podcast. Now, we do talk a lot about books and sometimes about training courses and software and equipment and things like that, but there is a lot of value in a lot of podcasts that are being published at the moment. More and more are coming to light, but there are some very well-established ones out there that we might start to recommend. As it turns out, we've known Alan for a while. Uh, Alan's been a member of the Preneur community and we've done some work with Alan in the past. So when Alan invited Pete onto the podcast, we thought, you know, this was a great idea. Love to support our Preneur community in any way we can. Uh, so we thought we'd also share that podcast with you. So I'm going to hand over now to Alan and Pete. So Pete Williams, welcome to the Infinite Pie Connection podcast. Alan, thanks for having me, buddy. Oh, no problem at all. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So, Pete, I've um, I've given a little bit of an introduction prior to prior to this, but uh, why don't you just take a couple of minutes to to tell people a little bit of your your background, if you like, and your story. What's brought you to the place you are now? Oh, mate, a, a very crazy journey over very many mountains and dips and valleys and all that sort of fun stuff. So, it's always a hard question to answer, really, because I've got my hand in. Uh, Pardon the pun, but quite a few different pies. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, my real world day-to-day -day focus, so to speak, or my core business is a uh, telecommunications group here in Australia. Mm -hmm. So we have a uh, number of offices around the country uh, selling, installing phone systems, doing carriage, uh, phone bills, um, and have a number of e-commerce sites um, under that banner as well. So mostly in the B2B space. So that's kind of the the day-to-day -day focus or at least two or three days a week of my life. Uh, then I do some consulting work um, involved in a software company, um, had a number of businesses, started my first one when I was 17. And uh, yeah, kind of do a lot of various different stuff. But at the end of the day, for me, it all falls down to sales and marketing. You know, I still don't know how to install a phone system or um, do any of the mechanical stuff related to any of the business I'm involved in. I just focus on the sales and marketing and let the, uh, the employees with the skills sort of focus on the delivery and the mechanics, so to speak. Right. And, and, and is that one of the core principles, you, you know, uh, surrounding yourself with experts in their own field and you stick to what you're good at and let them do what they're good at? Yeah, I think, you know, there's plenty of different ways to skin a cat, but the way I really focus on business and really encourage most entrepreneurs to focus about business is that it shouldn't be about the tool um, and it should be about the actual marketing and that, you know, so many people, a great example is, you know, you go and do an apprenticeship, whether it being a baker, a builder, um, you know, candlestick makers these days aren't around that often, but <laughs> that sort of thing. And what you do is you get out of this apprenticeship after three or four years and you're a really good mechanic. You're really, really good on the tools. Yeah. But then you think, okay, cool, the next step is to start a business. And you go off and you start a business and you have no skills about acquiring customers, converting those customers, getting to come back and purchase from you again, negotiating with suppliers for your margins. You know, and they're some of the seven key things that actually drive the profit of a business. And you know, so my focus is I'll focus on those seven things, the things that really drive profit. And then the actual delivery of the product has to be good. You know, we have to ensure that we have a good customer service and a good delivery of the product. 
But that's not my focus. I can employ people whose passion is the product of the various things, whose life works are about installing phone systems or, you know, baking or whatever it might be, and they can focus on that side of stuff, and I'll focus on the actual generation of customers and profits, and it sort of seems to be a, a great business model that's worked time and time again in so many different niches and areas that I've been involved in. Ah, interesting stuff. So you mentioned that you, you, you ran your first business or had your first business at 17. So has this entrepreneurial spirit always been within you? Uh, yeah, it has. I'm still just trying to f- figure out where it came from. Mum tells a great story of when I was about three or four years old, I apparently had crayons and drew arrows all the way down the hallway. And before mum decided to scold me, um, being the, the, the smart and, and caring and encouraging person that she was, she sort of actually sat me down and said, you know, honey, wh- why did you decide to draw on the, on, on the wall? You know that's not right. And apparently with beaming smile, I said to her, well, so you can find me in my office if you need me. So um, I don't know where that came from. My, my mum's a teacher. My dad um, ran logistics companies. So I wasn't really a, a quote-unquote entrepreneur. So it's not really in the gene pool, so to speak. But somehow, uh, you know, I, I lucked out and, and, and have that. So I've, I've been that way always um, on some sort of level, which is really cool. When I was younger, trading basketball cards quite seriously at our holiday um a place down in Ocean Grove, which is on the coast here in Australia. We used to run basketball card swap meets for the local caravan parks and stuff when I was, you know, in my teens and just always been that way inclined. So it's sort of, uh, it is part of my DNA. Okay. So, so you, you don't know where it's come from, but it's always been there. 17, you start your first business. It sounds like you've actually taken it on from there. When you started that first one, just going back to what you were saying a minute ago, were you on the tools as it were? back then or were you yeah. always that you know actually i'll i'll have the ideas and i'll get somebody else to implement oh uh, look I, I wasn't that much that 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 full of wisdom back in uh, <laughs> the teens and stuff but um you know i uh the first business was a, a company called um impact plus and it was a web development company so it was literally doing websites for local sporting clubs um schools a couple of local businesses didn't have a whole bunch of clients it was sort of you know i was at high school and you know between school partying and basketball you know there wasn't a lot of spare time but i was able to squeeze in a few paying clients here and there for for that little business and it was never something that was huge it was just um you know a, a business i did on the side but my mum encouraged me and took me to her local accountant and we registered a business name which was completely pointless you know there was no real need to do all that sort of stuff because it was a hobby business and um, that sort of stuff. But she was very encouraging and we you know, set up the business name properly and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, the accountant was uh, was really helpful and supportive as well and kind of gave me some advice that, you know, has probably stuck with me today that I surely didn't implement at the time because it was completely irrelevant. But, yeah, it sort of had that foundation there. But I definitely was on the tools coding and, and developing and stuff like that. I wasn't aware of outsourcing and there wasn't an Odesk 15, 20, you know, 15 16 years yeah, ago. Exactly. scenario. So, I mean, you say that it was it was probably completely irrelevant, but but it sounds like it wasn't because it sounds like it became quite foundational in your your thought process. Because obviously, the decisions and the the choices and the lessons we learn on a regular basis, um, and I know that you are a massive consumer of content. So it's all that type of stuff that would have just added into making you the person you are today. Surely. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's no doubt that sort of, you know, the, the stuff that was shared to me then and even like I remember going to my first, you know, business, like two-day business event when I was in high school. Um, my now godson's father, who was a good family friend of ours, um, was sort of into that space to a certain extent and, and I don't even know the exact how I turned up there but basically we had two extra tickets somehow. So mum and I went along with Bruce uh, to this uh, two-day, I think it was, it was either a full-day or a two-day event um, at the old um, – entertainment center here in melbourne which is you know a big sort of you know stadium madison mm-hmm. square garden type type thing here in melbourne and um i went to that event and i remember it was just close to my birthday and i um begged mum to instead of my birthday present let me go to the back of the room and spend my birthday money early and buy some cassette tapes and i listened to those tapes over and over and over again um it is a bit of a shame that the guy who put on the seminar ended up in jail but that's a whole other story <laughs> Let's hope that the lessons were right, but uh, you, you implemented them in a slightly different way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, 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 the reason you went to, business, went to jail was a business-related thing, but it was a completely separate entity. And um, 
scenario to what he was actually uh, talking about and teaching. It wasn't because he was trying to spruik stuff and, you know, there's all those spruikers who kind of, you know, end up in, in trouble. It wasn't because of that. The stuff he did teach, I think, still holds true and is, is very good, but just how he went about implementing and got greedy in some of his real-world businesses yeah. and, um, you know, some stock trading and some uh, insider trading and all those sort of fun and games that, mm. that can occur to people outside the, the their realm of skill set, I guess, or yeah. uh, moral bounds. <laughs> okay, so so you you 17 years old, you do this sort of hobby type business, but you're learning the practical application of what business is all about, and some of it's sticking, and some of it, you know, is going by the wayside, and you draw it back later. Where does it go from there? When did you feel that you really sort of d- it took on what you would class as your your first business venture, proper? This is me going for it, big style. Yeah, I think the real the pro- the first proper venture, so to speak, would have been the the selling of the MCG um, Australia's version of Yankee Stadium when I was 21. That was kind of the first big deal. I'd I'd traded some shares and I'd done some you know property sort of bits and pieces and and you know small sort of you know bits and pieces like that. But in terms of a proper venture that had a, a real business around it that actually made some profit that you know had a huge scale around it, that would, would have definitely been the MCG project that was. Um, which was hugely successful and was really a foundation of a lot of stuff I do now. And that, and 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 again, you know, uh, for people who haven't heard the story, the selling of the MCG. That you know, you're 21 years old and you've you've got this strap line that says the man who sold the G. Um, yep. You know, talk me through that one. How does that work? How does how does a 21 year old sell a sort of a national iconic stadium? Yeah, well, there was a bit of a media, um, you know, uh, around that in terms of the the story. But basically, to to, to pull it all together, I was um, just getting back from um, some time working in the USA. I'd, I'd done a, a stint with Athletes Foot, the uh, shoe store chain yep. here in Australia during university. That was sort of the, the job I had, and that were, that, were, that was probably one of the most influential things. The, the, the guys there ran a fantastic store, Belinda and uh, Tony and the team. They ran a fantastic retail store, one of the, probably the most profitable. Um, athletes foot stores in australia and very very smart about everything they did and um i guess directly or indirectly because of my nature they took me under their wing a little bit and i learned a hell of a lot from them so with that i was able to um you know leverage that relationship and actually spend some time in the usa working for athletes foot um the visa ran out came back to australia with plans to move back to the usa for a a girl as as you do when you're 2021 (laughs) and um was working at another athlete's foot store that um the owners of the geelong store that I'd worked at at university owned, helping them sort of get that set up and, and all that sort of stuff. And it was a relatively new store, so it was quiet with foot traffic. So I'd spent a bit of time behind the counter reading books and stuff just so I was in the front of the store in case someone walked in, I could serve them and do what needed to be done, but, you know, able to sort of, you know, leverage a bit of time. So I was reading a book called The One Minute Millionaire by Robert Allen and Mark Victor Hansen, which is a fantastic book, bit of a hypey title, but um, don't hold that against them. Uh, and the book tells, tells a story of um, – someone back in the 80s who basically bought a whole bunch of timber that was part of the Brooklyn Bridge walkway um, Mm -hmm. just between Brooklyn and Manhattan and was making certificates up with a history of the Brooklyn Bridge and a small inch by inch piece of timber, selling them off for about 20 bucks a piece. And uh, rumor has it that he made a couple of million dollars out of it. And I was like, how cool is that? Just turning an idea of something that's, you know, known, known to people that's memorable uh, and turning it trash into treasure type scenario. So I started to kind of think, you know, just literally that morning while I'm standing at the counter going, you know, what, what could I do? How, how could I potentially like, you know, just trying to, you know, think through ideas, which I do quite a bit and still do today when I see an idea, it's like, well, let's try and work that muscle and see if I had the time and inclination, how could I actually go about doing that? Not with any major intention of doing stuff now, I've got enough projects, but just to keep working that muscle. Mm-hmm. So back then I, I realized that the uh, Melbourne Cricket Ground um, you know, Australia's version of Lords or, or Yankee Stadium, for one of analogy, yep. um, was getting redeveloped for the Commonwealth Games we're having here. So that one of the stand and part of the stadium was actually getting pulled down, and it was all timber seating. It was, it was that old. It was all timber-based seating, and I was like, "Oh, perfect idea! Let's see if I actually make this happen." So with a, within a few phone calls, found the wrecking company that was doing the demolition and said, "Oh, do you have any of the timber seating just still lying around? Have you demolished it?" And they're like, "No, no, we've got it all here in our warehouse. Um, it's available. Like, just you know, come and grab it." It's like, "Oh, sweet!" And then part of that conversation, they mentioned we actually have some crested carpet lying there. And now that sounds really weird, carpet. What does it mean? But the MCC, the Melbourne Cricket Club, which was the you know, it's a it's a very prestigious members um, 
access to the stadium. It's, yep. you know, 50-year wait lists, quite expensive. You've got access to all the sporting events, blah, blah, blah. But the carpet in the actual members' dining room and bar is really, really ugly but really, really well known with the actual <laughs> crest of the club. Yeah. And being a bit of a memorabilia collector myself, I kind of, you know, tweaked it. Hang on, that's, there should be some value in that. So basically bought that sight unseen with a friend's credit card because mine was maxed out from um, being in the US partying. <laughs> Uh, and um, went down the next day, grabbed all the carpet that was there, grabbed a whole bunch of timber, took it back to the study and kept it in the study at mum's house and then um, subsequently turned that into a series of memorabilia pieces with a photo of the MCG, uh, a piece of that crested carpet, uh, a plaque outlining the history of the G and a limited edition number and stuff, made a series of frames. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. Like, again, this is probably the first inclination of getting the mechanics done by somebody else. Yep. Found a framer who could do all this for me and created frames up out of the timber um, for part of the series. And then, you know, from a marketing perspective, wrote a press release. 21 year old sells the MCG for under $500 uh, and sent that out. And it went absolutely bananas here in the Australian media, as, you know, I'm sure you could understand it was a pretty, very cool angle. Yeah. And just worked that media. And um, basically, that was the real first venture of serious substance that actually uh, I was involved in. It was a huge success and got a whole bunch of media, um, you know, stories around it, got some really cool nicknames, uh, got approached to do a book deal after that. So it was a really huge, successful little uh, little project that I, I worked on with a couple of uh, couple of people. That's fantastic. And again, I mean, they, they, uh, there's just so much <sighs> – actionable advice just off the back of that that i need to pick up on a few bits and pieces i mean i'm sure that the fact that you were you were 21 helped you know that that, that this is young right. audacious look at this guy getting off his backside and making something happen what a great strap line you know the selling of the mcg for under 500 bucks and all this sort of thing so i mean there's a lovely little story there but i i mean there's a couple of, a couple of things that you were talking about that I, i'm, I'm going to pick up on one is the fact that you said that um, that couple of athletes' foot, um, you said, was quite pivotal in um, the way that they ran things, but also the fact that they sort of took you under their wing. So, so what? They, they must have seen something in you to connect with you and go, "There's some potential in this kid that we want to enhance." Is is that fair? Is that relationship in uh, that sort of way? Yeah, I think so. Look, you know, we we don't. Um I'm not really in with it much anymore, not for any bad negative reason. I moved away from from Geelong and we catch up when I sort of walk through the store in Geelong to go shopping and stuff like that. But um, I think it was a, a combination of two things, them being an amazing family, uh, very, very switched on, uh, and also me stepping up to a certain extent, you know, yeah. wanting more responsibility, showing that I wasn't just a 20-year-old, 20, 20 19-year-old kid who was only interested in actually making enough money to then go and blow it at the bars on the weekends. Um, I think that kind of, you know, stood out a little bit. Um, we had some common interests, you know, being triathlete uh, at those days. The owner of the store was an ex-Australian triathlete, so we had a bit of, you know, connection there. And I think, you know, that I'd rather spend my weekends at least getting up relatively early on a weekend to go for a bike ride or a run, stop me sort of you being hungover all the time. So that kind of helped, I think, to show the type of person I was. And I was willing and, and asking for more responsibility. Uh, I was a great salesman. I'd, I'd, I'd read a lot of books on sales, so I was, you know, that helped as well. So I, th- I think it was all just a, a bit a mixture of both them being um, very, very smart, um, amazing in business, and also a combination of me willing to step up and actually kind of request that support to a certain extent as well, I think. And I, I think that's, in, in some ways, that's the key, isn't it? It's almost like, you know, from a coaching perspective, when I'm working with clients, I often talk about a matched commitment. And I think that that's what that sounds like to me. That was a very, there's something in it for both parties if we're prepared to meet in the middle here. Uh, so they were getting a certain benefit out of it, but also they were prepared to offer that development. And it's a question I've been almost asking myself and I've sort of been drafting a, an article on in relation to does everybody deserve um, the same level of development? And I, you know, and I, I, and I wonder if there's an answer to that in that sort of sense. But um, hmm. okay, so the next the next step is um, that the idea to implementation again. Twenty one years old. You just read a book. Lots of people do that type of thing. They put the book down. And they go on to the next one. You put the book down. Start thinking about the ideas. See an opportunity. What stopped you or what pushed you past that, what we call the, uh, the aha moments to getting past the ah, yeah, but moment? Because it would have been very easy to go, well, that sounds great in principle, but 
I don't have, you know, my credit card's maxed out. You, you could have found all the reasons why not to do it. Is it just your very nature that pushes you past that, or do, are you very measured in the way that you analyse ideas? Yeah, very good question. Uh, it's a, a hard one to answer without sort of, well, by, by giving value, I think, and it's going to sound really weird, but for me at the time, and this is this is the hard part, is that the, the only answer I've got right now is the context from where I had the idea. And the context was I was a 21-year-old kid who had nothing to lose. Right. So, you know, in that instance, at that time, it was like, well, what's my worst case scenario? Like, I get a job. I've got a job. Okay. Like, there was no, there was no real downside. Um, and I think that is easy to see from the outside from anybody, you know, whether you're 45 with three kids listening to this right now and going, oh, yeah, it's easy for you. You're 21 with no responsibilities. Uh, you could have a crack at that. But and then that is absolutely true. But at the same time, I think you know if you really analyse the situation, anybody any age could have done that project. Yep. You know, even like twenty one year old sells the MCG for under five hundred dollars is a good hook. But Melbourne man sells the MCG for under five hundred dollars is just a good hook. The yep. media would have latched onto. So don't sort of have the comeback going. Oh, you're twenty one, and you had the the media angle was better because you were twenty one, and you had no, um, you know bad alternatives and that sort of stuff. So that, that, that these are absolutely true facts, but don't let that become the argument for you not doing something. Yeah. So I, I really find it hard to, to articulate that answer because I've been asked it numerous times over the last 10, 15 years, 10 or so years now, um, and I'm still struggling to sort of articulate that in the most motivational way possible. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think that's absolutely fine. And again, like I say, I mean, it's that I often talk about the difference between excuses and obstacles. So, you know, an excuse to me is where somebody will tend to externalize, ah, well, you know, the economy's wrong or we live in the wrong area or I'm too old or whatever. And, and they'll externalize and they use an excuse to stop. Whereas if you internalize and you look at it as an obstacle, you try and find a way around it. You try and find, what can I do about this? And you try and find a, an opportunity to go around it. So it sounded like, and it sounds like, you continue to look inside and go, well, what does this mean to me and what can I do, rather than externalising and going, uh, you know, it, it's somebody else's problem, somebody else's fault that I can't do this. Just picking up on that, because you, you say that obviously that that, that particular um, situation was when you were 21, but you also said that you continue to use that idea muscle, whether or not you want more projects or not because you, you, you're quite loaded down, um, you still stretch that idea muscle. So the ideas are still flowing and coming, no doubt. So how do you, how do you want see ideas do they just are they just popping out or do you go looking for them two how do you capture them and three how do you then start to go it's something i want to explore or do you know what it's going to sit in a drawer and maybe one day i'll pull it out again and have a look at it uh yeah great question okay <laughs> so firstly in terms of how do i kind of do those ideas well, it's just about me reading and consuming stuff. You know, I'm a huge audiophile and listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts and that kind of obviously helps, you know, I guess fuel the, the fire a little bit there. And then it's about just, you know, having this sort of mental um, rule, I guess, sounds a bit wanky. Um, I guess it probably is. But sort of thing, I mean, how, can, how could I adapt this to my own sort of projects, you know? The, the overworn analogy of, you know, McDonald's swiped the drive through. Um, part of their business, which is obviously a huge part of their revenue these days yep. from the banking industry. You know, back in the early days in the US, you had drive-up windows in a lot of the banks. Yep. Um, so, you know, McDonald's swiped that from there. And it's an overused analogy, but it's it's probably the best one to use in that, you know, start thinking about, well, if that's what you see here in some sort of audio book about an online shoe retailer or a, a book about a software development company, what, what are they doing and what examples are they giving that you could potentially tie into your business? Just sort of think that through. Not thinking them through that you're going to have to implement and take action on them. Just sort of start thinking about, you know, oh, yeah, how could that potentially work around this? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I guess, the first element is just consume a lot uh, and then just try and um, not take action at all. Just think about how you can take action. That will just help sort of that idea muscle. Right. Um, then, I guess, you've got the, the other side of the coin of working out what do you implement and what do you don't. That that is a hard one, and, uh, and and we do struggle that with that because you know we have access to a lot of resources, with that time, money, whatever that we can sort of go after a lot of different things, and mm. that kind of can be a curse, can be a blessing. But um, I, I think realistically, it comes down to a couple of things: is you know, does it fit in with the current plan? 
making sure you do plan for, for set periods of time where it's, you know, 90-day plans and actually don't do anything deviating off that plan for those 90 days. You have that sort of idea file where you throw everything into knowing that you don't have to touch it for 90 days. You know, realistically, if you look at it, majority of ideas can last 90 days without being watered in that you don't have to implement the idea straight away. It's going to get stolen or lost or die. Very rare that something needs to be done in 90 days um, for it to succeed or not succeed. Yes, there are exceptions, but the majority aren't. Mm. Uh, and if you think that your idea is going to die for not implementing in 90, 90 days, you're probably going to be wrong. Some people will be right, but most people are going to be wrong. So I think it's about saying 90 days, put, into, put any, any ideas you have in that 90-day period while you're executing on the actual plan that you've got should be sat there, end of the 90 days, okay, here's the next 90-day plan. Go to that little well, go to that bucket, pick up those ideas, work out which ones you want to implement and then go from there. And, and part of that is also saying that, you know, what is going to generate the most amount of revenue quickly? Mm. You know, you've got to have medium to long-term plans as well. But, you know, is this idea a vanity idea or is it a profit idea? And they're, they're two very different things. Uh, yeah, and, and they certainly are, aren't they? I mean, that that's the thing. It's it's a bit like the um, – and one of the things that sort of started my premise for, for, this, um, for this podcast was, you know, the phrase, what gets measured gets managed. And I know that that's, a, again, a really popular phrase and it's absolutely spot on. But, again, it comes down to what you're measuring and, therefore, what behaviours you're driving off the back of that because you measure vanity metrics you're going to drive vanity performances and vanity behaviors aren't you so yeah it's the absolutely. same sort of concepts um absolutely spot on there so so I, I i i love that idea i love you know that that thought process of if you've got a plan in place for 90 days that sort of or, or you know on the basis of well i know what i should be doing for the next 90 days and this idea has popped up almost that i'm going to put this over the over there and just let it sit for a minute um, and, and, and sit still gives you that time for more information to gather for it to, you know, when you come back to it, does it still have that same passion, desire and interest um, whilst you've been managing your day to day plan? Because I think that sometimes what we can have this tendency of doing is we can get so excited about it. We'll only see in the same way that I said earlier about the ah, yeah, but moments where we can find all the reasons why not to do something. Sometimes we can get very blinded by all the reasons to do something, can't we? Oh, it's hot and it's shiny and exciting. And we go all guns blazing and, um, you know, maybe not quite as well thought out and planned as it should have been. Exactly. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what about, I mean, one of the things that I know that you're, you're, um, exceptionally good at because I follow your podcasts and, uh, and, and your blogs and other bits and pieces. So one of the things that I, I know that you're sort of renowned for is your workflow. So you're, you're very effective at, you know, planning things out, as you just said, with your 90 day plans, but also having workflows in place where you know at any given point, where things should go and how they should go. Is there projects that you start and you've got, if you like, measures in place or flows in place that, that, that highlight this one just isn't working? So we either need to, using the lean startup phrase, pivot, or do you know what? We need, we need to take that one off the shelf and, uh, and put it away for a little while. Do, have, you, have you made those type of decisions? Um. Yeah, I think I think that's part of being in business, and I I refer to it to most of it is like I wouldn't necessarily change the idea, it might just be the execution of the idea, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, one thing I learned very early on uh, was that what I think is completely irrelevant. You know, it's what the people with the wallets and purses think. <laughs> um, and you know, they are your, your true metrics. And you know, they, they talk about in the lean startup about you know, not going to the focus groups and all that sort of crap, and actually you know, testing something quickly. And, and we've done that for years in our businesses in terms of, you know, well, what we think might be a good layout for a web page or a good headline or whatever it might be is completely friggin' irrelevant. You know, it's about what the market uh, tells you it wants based on data. And that is why I love um, the web as, as, as one of the key platforms we use to drive our business, mm. um, that it is everything is measurable, manageable, um, instant feedback, um, that, you know, if you look at our original designs for our various projects, but whether it be one of the e-com sites or the telco website for lead gen or an information pu- publishing project, whatever it might be, is our initial concept and what actually ends up being the iteration that generates the most revenue is normally poles apart. And that's because we are continually, as we said, iterating. It's not about what, you know, I think the actual idea itself should 
be relatively solid. It has been numerous times for us. It just mm-hmm. there's always going to be tweaks to it, of course. But even the actual the implementation is going to be tweaked too, based on um, you know continual that feedback loop type scenario that they talk about. Yeah, so it's it's not about being so wedded to an idea that you're not prepared to listen to feedback and accept because again there's there's lots of different arguments for all these different stories isn't there there's some people who turn around and say steve jobs would be so determined of he was very clear in what he wanted and he's the attitude of people don't know what they want until we tell them what they want but ultimately um his his measure was well did people buy it? Did people go out and get that cool factor and enjoy using it um, and, and adapted it? And obviously, you know, you could use the, the latest. The iPhone now isn't the same as the iPhone when it first came out, is it? It's been adapted no. and adjusted and, you know, and, and, and reiterated throughout. So, yeah, I get that. You know, look, I love, like, I'm a huge Apple fan. But I'm, like, I, I think Mac software and Mac operating systems are, are amazing. and I'm very much for them. But I do think that Steve Jobs he's given a lot more credit than he deserves. Mm. In that, yeah, the iPod was amazing, but as uh, been sort of spoken about numerous times, that he wasn't he wasn't the first digital – he didn't pioneer that. Mm. He, they, had, they had the biggest marketing budget and were able to buy certain companies and take it to market very quickly and very profitably, but they weren't the first digital. Like I had an, I had an MP3 player before the iPod was released. Yep. It was a shitty little you know, piece of crap, but it did digital music player playing. Um even the, the iPhone was – there's no question the iPhone was a revolution, absolutely. But if you look through Apple's history, they haven't been amazing at every single thing they've touched. No. So, you know, I'm not trying to, to sort of, you know, dampen Steve Jobs by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, he had a couple of successes – which were huge because of the market he that the market share they were able to get based on the money and revenue they had behind them. But I don't think they did or have done it enough times to really prove that model of just do what I think is right, you know, um, over and over again. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. Or is it's is huge, but not, I'm not saying unjustified, but questionable. Yeah, and and it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next few years as well as to how they're sort of taking that more that, that information in. The other thing that I, I, just as we were we were talking about that sort of uh, that concept of you know ultimately it's about understanding what the the people who are you know in this instance prepared to open their wallets because again from the the, the concept of um, Robert Cialdini's book Influence there was always that uh, one of one of the the measures was that and I can't remember the phrasing at, at the moment but almost that concept of if you ask up front and get some form of commitment um, then m- m- people are more likely if they say yes up front they're more likely to go through with it later yeah, but, the commitment and consistency. Yeah, that consistency factor. Yep. That's the one. And uh, but but again, you know, how many? It, it it depends on who you're asking and what you, and what you're asking, I suppose. Because if you again, if you go and ask your your friends and family how wonderful an idea that you've just invented in your in your back shed is, they're likely to tell you that it's fantastic. But they're not necessarily the ones who are going to be buying it, are they? <laughs> Well, I think asking and making offers are two very, very different things that people confuse. Um, I remember hearing a story by from I think it was Guy Kawasaki who, who, tell, who told the original story of Sony when they originally made the boomboxes. This is before the iPod, mm-hmm. long before the iPod, the old boombox stereo sort of stuff that you see people walking around <laughs> on the shoulder. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and they did a focus group. And they got a whole bunch of kids in a room um, who was their target demographic and spoke to them uh, in the morning session and sort of said, you know, this is what we're trying to build. What, what color should it be? Should it be yellow or black? And, you know, in this focus session based on the conversations that were being had uh, and asking them, they said to these kids, you know, what would you prefer? And they all said yellow. Yellow's cool. It's bright. It's fun. It's funky. Blah, blah, blah. So it was all cool. And then, you know, the, the rest of the day went on apparently and I think the story goes that, you know, they, they got a tour of the factory and got distracted and all that sort of stuff. And then at the end of the day, they offered these kids the ability to take a broom box home mm-hmm. and said, before you leave, in that room, we've got the broom boxes. Go grab what you want. They all chose black. <laughs> so great story. How much truth to it is, I don't know. I'm pretty sure there's some fact given the the, the – the, um, strength behind the story the way it's originally told yep. but you know that's the difference between offering and asking they, they, they asked them what they thought and they all said yellow they yeah. offered them to actually transact and obviously they were free but they still offered them they all chose black yeah. so you know asking your friends and family is completely irrelevant 
you know, you got to make offers to the marketplace and see what they tell you. I think, I think, I think that's brilliant in itself. Just that difference between, like you said, asking and offering, fantastic stuff. Okay, so um, reading. You, you talked a minute ago about reading and consuming um, a phenomenal amount of material. So, how do you? I mean, with all the stuff that you do do and all the projects that you're involved in, how do you keep balance in your life? Um, great question. A, an amazing wife. <laughs> I think that's the, the first question is that, you know, I, I, I've been this crazy in, uh, um, since we, before we met. So she kind of, A, knew what she was getting into. Um, I wasn't trying to become somebody different after the fact, which I think can be hard for a lot of families. So yeah. I, I'm very lucky in that regard. Um, but, you know, this is the, the weird thing is that this sort of, you know, business stuff, because I've been doing it so long, it, it, I treat it more as a hobby, and I think that also helps too when I'm testing stuff because it's like, well, you know, it's, it's a test, it's a hobby. Who really cares? Mm. It's a very profitable hobby, but that's the way I treat it. So, to me, is I don't see this as needing to balance work and life because it's just what I do. It's yeah. what I enjoy doing. Uh, obviously, with a, a you know time of our conversation right now, five and a half month old baby, so definitely things have shifted because that has become a priority. Um, so, you know, things like my Ironman training and triathlon stuff has been put on hold because of that because I'm, so I'm giving up that sort of my life uh for for him and we'll do it you know all day every day yeah uh but from the business perspective is i i really enjoy it i've worked really really hard through my 20s so now i'm in my 30s i have the ability to sort of structure my life to give me that balance but still be able to work you know i'm only coming into the office here three days a week so you know i get two days a week at home now to sort of do you know quote unquote what i want most of it, it tends to be um, business related stuff that's what I enjoy but at least I'm home and I can sort of you know do the lunch feeds and 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 play around with him and get you between consulting calls and all that sort of stuff so you know I've worked really hard to have that position now so you know I don't want to sit up here on a on a on a throne saying that you know it, everyone can walk this path straight away I know this definitely can be done and there's plenty of people to do it I'm just not going to turn and, and, and say that, you know, everyone can do exactly what I do straight away because, you know, I've worked hard for 10 years at it. So it's, yeah. there is a bit of reality to, to, to the hype as well. It's it's a classic sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the t- taking 10 years to be an overnight success. Lots of people, can, again, yeah. on the outside looking in can go, ah, yeah, but it's all right for him because. But that's, that you know, but the thing that I liked about that, again, and it's something that I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, is this whole balance thing can come in lots of different ways. The old phrase of, oh, you don't want to be on your deathbed looking back and say, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. Well, actually, do you know what? If that's what you really connect with and enjoy, why not? As long as it's not in, in, in you know, that the, the, to the detriment of another aspect of your life where you have regrets. But, you know, the work-life balance as a phrase to me is, is a bit of a mis- misnomer because it implies that work isn't part of your life and life isn't part of your work. And it's what you bring to it that, that, uh, that I think makes the difference. So, so, okay. But to keep that balance in perspective and to keep, um, you know, you mentioned Ironman training and you, 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 you do aspects of that and you connect with that, but you've let it, that sort of go a little bit for now, but it'll be back on the horizon in the future. But what about, uh, so you've you mentioned that you consume lots of books. You've mentioned that obviously you're a bit of a Mac fan. You've mentioned obviously that, um, that you do the Ironman training. What, what, if you like, um, I, I often talk about connecting to more than just people. So we connect to places and things and tools. You talked earlier about making sure that things serve you rather than you serving them. So, again, when we look at tools, we want to make sure that it's doing something for our purpose rather than the other way around. So is there is there any tools or processes that you use on a regular basis that make your life either happier, fuller, or simpler? Uh, yeah, Mac software and Mac computers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> better get back to the state, get, get back in line with the gods of, of Apple. But um, no, look, there's, there's a whole lot of applications. This is something that actually I think freaks a lot of people out. Is that I don't consider myself a first mover when it comes to new software. Mm. Um, I talk a lot about software in my workflows and stuff, and, and that people make this assumption and connection that I'm, you know, always onto the hottest thing. But I very rarely use a tool within its first three or four months of coming out. I'll let all the, all the friends of mine who are the, the people who like to get distracted with new tools and change their workflows and, and, and have a new tool embedded in that workflow um, and then waste this time and profit by doing that. And I'll wait to see which, which tool of theirs actually sticks right. and then I'll actually adopt it. 
um, which I think is a big surprise to a lot of people is that, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes through every single day that's, you know, it's exciting and used and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll be one of the last to implement it, but when I implement it, I'll implement it hard and properly. Right. Um, so other people sort of do that that trial and error for me and, and stand on their shoulders. Uh, but in terms of tools that I use, uh, look, the iPhone is a huge one for me. Um, a lot of apps on there. Uh uh, OmniFocus, I'm a big uh, David Allen getting things done advocate uh, mm-hmm. as a way to sort of run your your day-to-day task list. Um, so OmniFocus is huge for me because it can sync between the, the Mac, the iPhone, and the iPad. Yep. Um, so that's sort of my, my diary, if you will, my to-do list. I use Evernote uh, as my filing cabinet. So that's sort of where I file stuff. That's all I use it for is literally just a virtual filing cabinet because you can categorize stuff in files and folders and it's all scannable and searchable, even photos, which is which is really cool. Um, Gmail is the tool that, that we're using all our businesses for, for that. That way it's all on the cloud. Um, Skype is a huge tool for me for, for, for connecting with people and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, what else? I use, I use Notational Velocity uh, and Simple Note, which is a great tool that allows you to sort of sync notes uh, across different devices. So that's kind of like my virtual notebook. So the way I treat software is very analog in that, you know, prior to computers being around, there there was there were tools for certain things. So you had a filing cabinet for your files. Mm-hmm. You had a notebook for your notebook. You had a diary for your diary. So when I come to using tools, I really try and be very, very clear on what analog replacement that is and not try and get too cute and have different things doing multiple things. Like I know people who use Evernote for their notebook, they're getting things done platform and their filing cabinet. And I just can't personally get my head around how that's manageable because when you're in Evernote, what are you doing in Evernote? Which which one of those five different things are you doing? To me, when I'm in Evernote, I'm searching for files that I've filed away. When I'm in OmniFocus, I'm looking at things to do. So they're, they're one tool, one use, uh, and I think that um, I guess it's almost a frame or context or even a positive constraint to a certain extent is one of the big successes of, of why I can get everything done because when I'm, when I'm in a certain application, I know why it's there. When I'm in my Gmail, it's because I am writing correspondence. It's not my to-do application. It is a correspondence tool like my mailbox was back 15 years ago yep. um, or the fax machine was. So it's, you know, like it's very clear that, you know, you, your inbox – everyone probably knows – from GTD and Inbox Zero crap, that um, Inbox should be not your to-do list. But so many people use it as their to-do list. What's in their Inbox is stuff they need to deal with. Well, that's not how I use it. It is for me. It is a communication device. If I have to actually action something and I can't do it straight away, it goes into my action list, which is OmniFocus. So I move stuff around very, very quickly. See, I like that. I, I, I've, I've written down the one tool, one use, and I, I because that's something I'm certainly going to apply. Because I probably, as as much as I like to keep things very simple, I probably fall into the trap of 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 what you just said, where I look at things and go, so how how can I use that most effectively? And sometimes that slips into more than one use. And I think by simplifying it, it's going to make a massive difference to me. The the um, the inbox as a to do list, I find really fascinating because. The concept of the inbox, your email inbox as a to-do list is effectively you're allowing somebody else to set your to-do list in that basis because your inbox is filled by somebody else. So, mm. <laughs> so conceptually, you are allowing other people to set the tasks on your to-do list if you, if you have that mindset. So that's yeah. That's- I- I, I, I actually disagree with that slightly. Um, I only think it's a bit controversial. Is that, I think that is absolutely <laughs> true, but that's what everyone sort of talks about. Where I think if you really look at it, a lot of the stuff in your inbox is actually replies to stuff you facilitated. Right. So if I, you know, if I look at my inbox uh, right now, I've got you know a response to an email I sent. I've got a request for consulting. I've got an email from a course I'm going through at the moment. I've got a request from someone about a meeting. I've got uh, a couple of emails from from my team telling me what their daily actions were. So my inbox right now, if you look at it really, it's mostly people responding to my agenda. Right. So I think this this, this I, I do agree with to, to a lot of it an extent that your inbox is other people's other people's agenda, but I think that's a cop out. I think realistically, the inbox, if you if you're doing your job right, the majority of your inbox should be replies to stuff you're practically managing. You know, people can get people know my email address is not that hard to find, but I, I farm that stuff off very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. To someone else to to deal with. So, you know, the way I manage my inbox is, you know, mostly if I'm, I'm like flicking through here, I've got 30 odd 30 odd emails in my inbox right now. Uh, 31 to be exact. And majority of these uh, I can probably see uh, seven or eight emails right now 
that are of people who have emailed me for things. The rest of it is generally people responding to stuff that I initially facilitated. So it's actually my agenda. Okay. They're, 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 they are applying to my agenda. So I think that people need to be very clear. Just don't buy in, don't buy into the the stuff that's out there on the web because everyone kind of jumps on that bandwagon and, and, and repeats. Um, I think at the core of it, it's absolutely correct. Well, I, I think I think the question is, are you the norm? <laughs> because, uh, because 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 I, I I think that, that, that you know it, it, you, the, and again I'm not I'm not saying that in a I'll, I'll sort of bounce the same provocative sort of a, answer back that the way that you just described it absolutely spot on but I wonder based on the conversations I have with people who are stressed up to their eyeballs with I've got 148 emails in and and they're almost wearing like a badge of honor I've got 148 <laughs> emails in my inbox and I don't know how to do it and and I got it down to zero a few days ago but it's straight back up as soon as I clear it they they come back in again and again actually the number is sort of irrelevant it's more about the mindset that you just stated that's important are you in control of it or is it in control of you Mm. And that's the key for me, I suppose. So, you know, I, I, I love that. Going back to your iPhone, um, is that where you consume? Because I, I, you listen to a load of audio books, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So is it, on, again, on the iPhone? All yeah. The iPhone. yeah. All the, a mixture between the iPhone and uh, the iPod Shuffle. So um, the Shuffle when I'm actually out running or, or on my bike. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of, you know, driving to the office and, and, and around and about places, it's generally the iPhone because with the actual um, – I just use the iPod, um, sorry, the, the podcast app and the um, audiobook app, just the default app. So I'm not sort of into Stitcher or um, any of the sort of podcasting apps that are out there. I just use the ones that are default. Yeah. I find them more than, more than adequate for what I need. Brilliant. And, and, and whilst you consume lots of books, are you a, are you a podcast consumer as well or – yeah, I, I go through phases with that sort of stuff, um, funnily enough. There's, there's definitely a bunch of podcasts I, I subscribe to, but I'll, I kind of generally uh, – there's no logic to this or science. I don't take this as advice, but um, <laughs> what I do is that I'll go through maybe you know two audio books back-to-back uh, of different type topics, and then I might spend a week just chowing through podcasts. Then I'll ignore podcasts for three weeks. Then I'll catch up again. Yeah. Um, I think I just probably get sick of the same person's voice for you know six episodes in a row. So um, yeah, I definitely devour podcasts, but for me, it, it is a sporadic kind of stuff. But people who listen to your podcast and my podcast should absolutely listen to them every single week. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and on that basis, then you were talking about books. I mean, obviously, uh, listening to your podcast, which I'll put links to, Preneurcast, fantastic, you and Dom. Um, you, uh, you obviously, you talk about the fact recently. You've been talking about the fact that you're getting lots of uh, books, and actually, publishers coming to you with, "Read this book, listen to this book, have this book. What about this book? Can you can you review our book?" How do you choose that? How do you sort of cut through? And again, to to quote your um, your blog, the noise reduction or your email um, that comes out, the noise reduction. How do you cut through the noise and go, "This is this is what I want to check out and listen to at the moment." Great, great question. A couple of things. One is just is, is suggestions from people. Uh, obviously, you know, I get approached by a lot of books, and they'll, they'll sit on on the shelf, sort of clicking dust a little bit, until someone says, "Hey, have you read this book?" And they'll be like, "Okay, cool, I'll go and read it." Uh, again, not really trying to necessarily always be the first to read a book because I don't want to waste my time. I'd rather other people, you know, forge that path through the forest and let me know that's actually a, a, a good journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one thing. Secondly, when people do you know, solicit us and send books our way. Um, you know, we, we know if they actually t- take the time to care about our community. You know, we've had over 100 shows now of the Preneurcast podcast that we've been doing for a couple of years. You know, a huge community of, you know, 45 or so thousand people mm. that, you know, I want to make sure that they care about our community. So to make sure that, you know, if they just send us a blatant cold pitch for a book, I'll go, yeah, send me the book, uh, but I won't, I won't open it because if they don't care enough to sort of take the time to actually think about how does that fit with our community, is it a, is it a fit for our community, all that sort of stuff. You know, I'm not going to give them the time of day if they won't respect our community at all. So that's secondly. Thirdly, I'll, if it's something that does interest me, like they, they approach us the right way, it'll generally be, okay, what part of the book, which chapter, which section do you think is most relevant to, to our audience? And then I'll read those three or four pages or that, that one chapter. And that gives me a feel for, A, do they, you know, have they thought about who our audience is? And then I can devour that part and go, okay, yeah, there is a fit there. I like this style of writing. I'll go out to the start and, and consume the book all the way through. Um, so that's how I, I, I sort of go through traditional books. In terms of audio books, um, 
the audiobooks I consume are through my Audible subscription, mm-hmm. uh, and that is primarily driven by referrals for people. So it's very rare that I have an audiobook suggestion for the podcast in that you know, audiobooks are generally not released till after the actual print book goes to print because audiobooks aren't traditionally um, – counter towards bestseller rating so a lot of publishers except for the big ones who who are going to land on the list based on you know historical stats and mm-hmm. size will go to market first with a, with, a, with a print book try and get the seller lists and then on the that result then subsequently get the audiobook out so most books we get a a, a pre-release so it's obviously only the the kindle version or the print version yeah um, so yeah the audiobooks come off referrals from people saying hey here's a book you may have missed check it out it's awesome and that, that's how i consume those and, and, and decipher those ones ah makes sense makes sense okay so has there been a book that recently that you've found yourself recommending to others um yeah, it's been there's been a, a bunch of books I've been listening to recently that kind of all have tied in and, and referred to each other. Funnily enough, so a great book called Start uh, by John Acuff. Uh, the audio version is a must listen to. He is uh, an amazing orator. Is that he said orator? Orator? Yeah, yeah. Is that the right word. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's a public speaker by by by, by profession, and he, the way he enunciates and articulates this book is just brilliant, and the content's amazing. Uh, it's about starting projects and getting started. Uh, Willpower uh, was a great book, um, The Power of Habit. Uh, so there's been a whole bunch of books I've consumed recently all around sort of getting started and commitment and consistency, building habits, um, getting over willpower, getting over friction, that kind of stuff. So there's been a whole bunch of stuff recently in that sort of area that I've found really interesting of late about sort of um, – that sort of issue that a lot of people face. Yeah, well, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how I work with my clients on how to get from idea to implementation because the idea is one part, but actually, you know, you've got to start and you've got to stick with it, haven't you, to make to make, to make a difference. So uh, they sound like certainly. I mean, I've read I've read uh, at least two of those, but I think I need to check out Start. I don't think I've got that one on the bookshelf, so I'm going to have to. Very very cool. And uh, and you'd recommend listening to that one as well. You're saying that the, the style yeah. and approach that he yeah. Right. Yeah, look, I, I haven't read the book. Uh, I've only listened to it, but the, it, it probably has to be one of the – probably, if not the, one of the top three or four audio books I've ever listened to. Um, not in terms of the content necessarily. Look, the content is amazing and, and is worth consuming in any format. If you're not an audio person, still buy the book. The content's, content is worth definitely reading. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the enjoyment of listening to an audio book, it was one of the most engaging audio books I've heard in a very, very long time. Okay. okay. That's, that's fascinating itself. So um, – because because – the fact that you're talking about that with such such conviction tells you that that you know it it, it obviously stood out uh, in that way. Now, one of the top tips I took from you in a, in a podcast many many years ago, well, many many months ago at least, um, was that you listen to a lot of stuff uh, again because of the amount that you consume at two speed. Now I do that as well. Now, did you do that with Start or you know? Uh, yep, definitely two speed. So even stood out. At two speed, the, the the style and approach that this guy had, it still stood out in, in, in two speed. Brilliant. Yeah, his pacing, his articulation, his emphasis. It was it, it was a masterpiece. The way he actually just articulated that book, it was even at two speed, it was just really captivating. Fantastic. Okay, look, I'm getting to the end now because I'm really conscious of your time. But um, it sounds like lots of people are reaching out to you at the moment. So this question might come out as a little bit of left field. But given the opportunity, who would you love to connect to, and why? Ooh, good question. Um, don't know. It's, it, it's going to sound a little arrogant, I guess, but most of the people I want to connect to, I've, I've, I've built up very strong networks over the last sort of 10 or so years. So most people I can kind of reach relatively easy. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know what? Probably the, it's going to sound very strange, but probably Ben Affleck in terms of I respect him as an actor and a director and as a writer. And I think he'd be a really cool guy to chat with um, just about the, the business of, of show business. Um, so I think he is someone that's completely left field, I, I would assume, for most people who's, who's you know, anticipating an answer from me. Uh, but I think, you know, Ben Affleck would be really cool to sort of have a chat with and sort of see, you know, how he goes about the creative process of, you know, writing and directing, you know, movies and, and even acting to a certain extent, more so about the directing and writing side of things. He's, you know, written a couple of great screenplays yeah. and won Academy Awards and stuff. It'd be really cool to get that idea of, you know, how hard it actually is to make a movie and, and what it takes. Ah, fascinating stuff. Now, I love that from the perspective of obviously you've been really interested in in him and it really is a left field one. So that, that, that 
I, I, I enjoy that as well. But let me let me spin the question around a little bit for you as well. What would what if you had the opportunity to sit down with him and obviously you know have that conversation and be interested in him? That's that's one part of it. But what do you think you would bring to the party for him? Um, good question. <laughs> um, I'm getting good at this. <laughs> what would I better offer Ben Affleck? Look, I, I think realistically, I think you know some some different ideas around you know I should have no freaking idea to be honest <laughs> uh, I, I, I could bring a really good coffee from a coffee store down the road for him I could pick up a great bagel and offer him a great bagel um, yeah like look I top of my mind there may be some connections maybe some ideas about do you know probably what it would be actually probably marketing the movie online I think that would probably be where, where there could be a good fit in terms of you know effectively using online communities and networks to, to market a film without this the blatant um, traditional advertising that's moved online in terms of rather than just buying ads on YouTube yeah. and, and banner ads and stuff like that, doing some creative sort of community-based um, stuff, you know, th- even throughout the movie production, I think that would be really cool is that someone's producing a movie to kind of really be open and transparent about the movie-making process and really build an audience up before the movie even hits the cinemas oh, wow. that – you would almost have like a wave of people going, you know, kind of similar to what Robert Kiyosaki did with Conspiracy of the Rich yep. when he wrote that book. Um, what he did is he actually kind of blogged throughout the writing process, shared drafts of chapters with people who could help contribute to the to the tweaking of it. And I, I don't wouldn't suggest Ben actually you know, give away the screenplay and get people to help, you know, draft the dialogue or anything like that. But I think you could do a much better way of you know sharing, you know, not trailers but like you know grab pull the iphone out and record dicaprio running a scene or running a line and put it up on youtube and talking to the 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 actors throughout the process and interviewing the the grips and the lighting guys talking about how they light certain scenes and really build that um i guess the journey up for the audience prior to the movie i think that'd be really cool See, um, and then I've also got a screenplay idea that I take to him too. There you go. See, it's all coming out now. <laughs> now I love that because again, isn't it interesting? I love that for two two aspects. One, the actual marketing goal that was in there. Um, but also just the fact that what starts off with that, do you know what? I don't really know that there was so much in there really. And the, and the value that you, you could add. And the, and the, and the third bit is that I really genuinely believe that stake in that community, when people feel involved and they have a stake in something that they want to be part of that success, they want to, 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 you know, to be that tidal wave behind it, don't they? So, um, so I thought that was fantastic. It's interesting. I, I think you know, movie making is almost one of the very few final frontiers that haven't become transparent. Mm. In that, you know, like everyone can now make a movie on their iPhone. That's you know, so, so that sort of stuff's been forged and done. But you know, there's so many businesses now that it's very transparent about how they actually operate. But movie making to the average Joe who goes to a cinema is still a bit of a mystery. And I personally would like to just to get a feeling of what that journey's like personally. And yeah. um, I think you know, the first. Um, studio to actually go to market with that, and I, I don't think it would. Ha- it could be a movie like um, Transformers or Superman, where it's huge, hugely visual effect type scenario. Yeah. You could do some of it and share how they're made, but that kind of takes the illusion away. But a story like a Ben Affleck type movie, um, where it's sort of it's it's, it's very dialogue driven, and, yeah, and character driven. You could share the movie making process without screwing up the story and mm-hmm. the surprise of the story, and I think that could be kind of cool. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm I'm just sitting there thinking of Goodwill Hunting, for example, and and you know, and it, getting behind the scenes and having that conversation with the Matt Damons and the Robin uh, Williams and 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 Ben about the whole process and pulling back the curtain a bit. It's almost like DVD extras before the thing actually comes out, isn't it? So yeah, brilliant. That's, that's what it is. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, I'm going to flip the question around a little bit now, um, which is, who would you suggest that I connect with? And why? Who who do you think that you know that I should be sharing their story as well? Um, ooh, great question. Um, who should you be connecting with, and why? Um, look, really, I think if you're shooting for the stars, I'd be going for some of the you know the the guys on Shark Tank in the UK, and you know people know their story, but really actually getting down to sort of what drove them, I think they'd be really cool to hear. Is that you know I think for a lot of people on that sort of Shark Tank, 
you know, show or who are classes entrepreneurs in the TV. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is their real story? What was their real challenges and stuff like that? You know, let's forget about, you know, they created FUBU and made billions of dollars. Like, what was their first two businesses that failed? Yeah. What were they doing before that? Like, have a conversation with someone who people know and are aware of, but talk about something that they've never spoken about before. Talk about some of that stuff beforehand. And I think that'd be really interesting for people to, to hear and connect with. Great story. Yep, brilliant. I'll be looking to do that because I can think of uh, a few people that, um, that uh, already come to mind off the back of that. Okay, so wrapping this up, um, top tip that you've um, that you, that either you've been given in the past that you live and you know breathe all the time, or you constantly give out. If you had to summarise, top tip, actionable advice. What what do you tend to find yourself saying a lot? There's no such thing as internet marketing. <laughs> now I've heard you say that a lot, but go on. You, I'm going to let you have a couple of seconds to explain that one. Oh, look, I think p- people, are, and it's probably not your community necessarily, but a lot of people are out there saying, oh, I'm an internet marketer, and that's the biggest load of crap I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Unless you actually you know, sell the internet, um, you're not an internet marketer. You're a, a business owner or a, a want-to-be business owner whose only path to market is the internet. That's what you know, really is what you are. And when you really make that distinction, you actually start thinking of your business as a business and the internet as a tool, a medium and a path to market. Um, and, you know, people sort of say, I'm an internet marketer and they one day they're a publisher of, of eBooks and they're a publisher. The next week they're a, um, you know, uh, e-commerce store and the following week they're you know something completely different it's like well no you, you've been three different businesses in three weeks like how do you expect to be successful <laughs> um, pick, pick your model and work that model excellent love that okay Pete, it's been a joy and a pleasure if people want to get in touch with you how do they find you how do they connect with you yeah, sure. Look, I'd say uh, preneurmarketing.com. Um, so, preneur is an entrepreneur. So, mm-hmm. P-R-E-N-E-U-R marketing.com uh, is where the blog is, sort of the hub of everything I kind of do uh, online. Uh, you can download an audio book version of my first book, which sort of tells the story of the um, MCG and the, the, the subtitle of that book is actually from idea to implementation. So, it's <laughs> a good fit with what you talk about as well. So, people can go there, download that audio book, um, join our community, listen to our show and uh, – party with us brilliant well let's see if i can uh, i can be sharing that far and wide because i've enjoyed the the two and a half years of listening to you i remember my first listen was driving from one side of the country to the other and i think i had about seven episodes loaded um, <laughs> and uh, and i just followed it that so i did listen to six or seven episodes on the trot um and and i've just been following it ever since and really enjoyed it so uh thanks ever so much for your time today and uh, and i wish you the continued success that you deserve Awesome, Alan. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, to everyone else who's listening, hope you got some amazing value. Oh, there's definitely some. Uh, well, I certainly have been scribbling notes. So if other people haven't been, then uh, they need to go back and listen again. So as Pete said there, I really hope that you got some value from that. It's a little different perspective to what we normally cover on PreneurCast, but it gives you an insight into Pete, the way that he thinks, the way that he comes up with ideas, the way that he works. And also it gives you an idea about this other podcast, the Infinite Pie Connection, that Alan runs. And maybe you're interested in taking a look at that over at infinitepie.co.uk. I'm going to leave it there, but please do let us know in the comments over at preneurmarketing.com if you're liking these kind of guest interviews, different people interviewing both myself and Pete, if it's uh, a thing that you're interested in, if you like this kind of content. And also, if you have a podcast that you'd like us to feature on, just drop us a line at support at preneurgroup.com. Pete and I are both happy to join in and help out members of the Preneur community produce their own content and uh, just give our opinion and help out in whatever way we can. So, see you all next week. been enjoying another fine episode of PreneurCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via PreneurCast at PreneurGroup.com.